fantasy world thousands of years ago was ruled by an ancient civilization which has disappeared and nobody knows what has happened to them but we can find their ruins all over the planets there are these huge stone structures that nobody knows what they are meant to be and now about thousand years into the past we have the Dracorian empire and the Dracorian empire somehow discovers how they can use the artifacts from this long forgotten civilizations uh, people call the ancients and that basically gives them access to magic which is such an advantage about everyone else that the Dracorian Empire conquers the complete world in a couple of hundred years. And now 400 years into the past, we have the son of the emperor killed um, uh, at the court by a complot. And he does something that you shouldn't do. He brings uh, with the power given to him, his son back to life. And um, now the empire has an undying eternal um, emperor on the throne, like the I'm last good. emperor, <laughs> and yet um, after a couple of hundred years, of course, he goes megalomaniac and declares himself a god. Oh, and what good. what did we learn from history? A god doesn't want to have other gods besides him, um, so he brings the Imperial Inquisition into life, and the Imperial Inquisition eradicates all other religions on the planets, and so the old gods fall into slumber because like they are deprived of their worshippers and that leads to a cosmic imbalance and in the middle of the empire and the heart of the empire and that's uh, now we have reached um, the, the uh, here and now there is a rift opening to the sphere um, of chaos through which the attack on the mortals begin and the emperor immediately knows that this is a war that he can't win and he decides that if he has to go down, he's taking everybody with him. So he performs a ritual that uh, will be known as the curse. And the curse basically takes up all the life energy of the planet, of all, on almost all living beings, trees, plants, animals, and uh, um, uh, uh, humans, and uses all their life energy to close the rift. And this is uh, where we find ourselves. The map that you can see here in front of you depicts the Isles of Azul. And the Isles of Azul in, in Star Wars terms are in the Outer Rim. They are the last corner of the world as far away as possible from the, the mainland and the Imperial uh, capital. And the curse hasn't reached uh, the islands completely. It has died off because it has. Um, succumbed enough enough energy and the islands of Azul are still um, uh, were still conquered by the Empire and um, we are the the people of Azul enslaved by the Empire until until this day and we are approached by a group of druids that tell us what, ha what has happened and that the Emperor is dead and the Empire is um, uh, destroyed and what we find here are the last broken remnants of the empire and they tell us that if we combine our forces uh, we can rebel against the empire and to regain our freedom the problem is the empire is not our only problem since chaos has entered the world they are the hordes of chaos and they are on the way to azul as well and so we are kind of sandwiched between the empire in the middle and that is one of the factions or the, the, the AI enemies that we have to fight. And, and they come from the center of the board. And we also have to fight against chaos that will come over the frozen seas from the outside. And that is the setting that we, we find ourselves in here. All right. And we're going to go through a full solo play for a first time game. Uh, with Uprising, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how this one plays out and showing you guys how this plays. I've got two factions down below right here. So I have Call right here controlling this faction in red, and over here we have Fainur with this off green color. So these are two factions, and they're located in two different spots currently on this map, so on opposite ends. Uh, we have kind of an existing area around the outside of the board, and the layout of this board is going to change based on. Uh, the setup as well as the difficulty that you're selecting but you've got 
this whole layout on the outside. You can see there's uh, Fog Grave, Howling White, all these different locations out there. And then in the center, we have all these unexplored uh, tiles or hexes that we can move through, as well as the capital in the center. We have our havens on both of the uh, locations that our heroes are currently on. So again, this solo game here, I'm controlling two. And for this one, as I mentioned, I'm playing for the first time. We're doing a first run game, which means I'm only going to be moving through two chapters of the experience. And there's actually a total of four if you're playing full-fledged. But in this preview, we're going to be focusing on just the first two chapters. So the aim of the game uh, for win conditions and technically even loss conditions is to ensure that both factions I'm controlling are actually ahead of the Legion and the Horde, so the two other individuals I have to take care of throughout this, and they're in purple and yellow. I have to make sure that my two trackers for both my heroes are further ahead uh, than both of those other factions. So it's uh, it's a race on the score track, and it definitely keeps you on your toes, even if one of mine is, a, is in front of both of them. Uh, and the other one is, say, in the middle of the two, uh, I'm still going to end up actually losing the game. I need to have both of them way ahead. So I want to get them out in front as fast as possible. We'll see if I can pull that off. Um, so the first thing you're going to do when you start Uprising is you're going to check your refresh phase. The thing is, when you're running through the game at the very beginning, the refresh phase is mostly set up from the setup. So you won't have to do too, too much here. So you're going to reveal a Druid card. This is really important. So there's four of them around the board. You can pick one and then go ahead and flip it. So I'm going to do that now. So here we've got the Mountain Heart. So this one has for every bolt, and this is a bolt that icon we'll see on a die later on. Uh, during any archery and clash, these are the two stages of battle. So archery comes first, you do it once, and then clashes come next, and you do it indefinitely until there's a re resolution of that battle. Ignore all of the uh, damage showing on one die your enemy rolled, and you do this before uh, damage once per round. So we'll have to see whether there's a particular time we want to do this, but it could come in pretty handy. Um, and then we want to flip all of our cards face down. We're not going to do this right now because we haven't actually played yet, but we will have cards that we will spend or they'll state that they need to be flipped, like feet cards, which we have in our hand currently. Good example would be one over here for Fenyor. It says flip this to gain one uh, salt, which is a resource for every sword sister, which is an actual unit you can have out there in play. So these are the types of cards we'd flip back over. And we want to make sure we have eight action points. So both of our characters have a bowl here of action points. Should be eight in there. And then below that, we have deal three new items, deal three new quests. We've already gone ahead and done those steps as part of setup. So we don't have to do that right now. But in the future, we'll be discarding what's there and bringing out some new ones. And then we're going to pass the first player token. Again, we don't have to do this here because we already have Paul going to be going first. So we can move right into the next phase. The next phase is the events phase. So the first thing you do is to add two threat to all legions and hordes in play. So what it's referring to there is there's these cards over here. And these cards are going to represent the miniatures or standees that you're seeing over here on the right uh, in purple and yellow. And so the colors will help you to keep things straight. So purple for legion, yellow for horde. And these cards are eventually going to come out on the board and uh, they'll sit just beside the board. And this is where we'd actually bump the threat up, which is the tracker. And that determines basically their strength overall. So, and that's also what we need to knock down to zero in order to defeat them. So at this point, with nobody in play, there's nobody to bump up. We don't have to do that. Then the next thing states, the first player draws and reads the next event. Now, this is really important because we do have to determine what exactly is going on in the world. And this is really where things start. Uh, so this is chapter number one. So we'll take a look at the event level one card and we'll flip it over. It says, many refugees are coming across the frozen wastes in the north, now called the Screaming Sea. They offer you everything they have left for your shelter and protection. It states, every player may place one action on the trade action to gain an item from the market they can use, or they can spend two actions for an item they can't use. So basically, in order to figure out what you're allowed to actually purchase from the market, you can see this market up here has three items and you can see the cost in the bottom left so in this case for dragon fruits it's three salt this one right here ensures you need to have a lead or leadership point on your hero in order to get this one plus two salt and then the one below it here is for guile you need two and or four uh, and four salt as well so it's not an or it's an and you need both 
So I'll go ahead and have Call here. He's going to actually take this Dragon Fruits card. And I do have to normally pay three salts. But in this particular case, being that as the event states, I only have to just go ahead and pay a single action for this by placing one of these action tokens on the trade action. That's all I have to do. I don't have to pay the salt in this case. So really, that card was specific to the restrictions of the abilities that are on each of the heroes. So you can see there's Might, Magic, Lead, and Guile. You'll see how those are also used with other things in the game later on as well, beyond just the items. But this Dragon Fruits card is going to be handy for getting some resources later on, so that's pretty nice. Uh, this one isn't always. It's uh, adding one red die to any of your rolls outside of combat. So that's actually pretty awesome as well. Um, I still think potentially for right now, I'll stick with the bow, but that is another card that I could definitely go after. Uh, even Paul might even want that one. We'll have to see how it goes. So I'll take this one and we'll pay one action over here for Venure. So you can see by doing this, I'm actually kind of reducing, well, I am effectively reducing how many actions I'll have in the action round. So that's kind of the cost of doing what I'm doing here. And then we have another item that popped out as well. So this one says uh, it'll happen or you can use it during the archery and clash. Discard this. You and your enemy gain one black die every combat round. So things get real wild. Okay, so that is that for the drawing of the event, but we still have the bottom half of this as well. So it says, amongst them are many that report horrible things they saw on the destroyed mainland they left behind. Place one horde at threat four in the Screaming Sea, not adjacent to a haven. So this is pretty straightforward. You take a look at the outside of your board. Screaming Sea, you can see, is close to uh, Fenyar. So we've got a bunch of options, but uh, there's probably, there's about seven uh, hexes we can place on, but there's some restrictions. We can't put it adjacent to one. So that actually eliminates three of the hexes. Um, so what we'll do is go ahead and grab a horde card, flip it over to find out who exactly is coming out. So we have the false messiah. And there's something that happens immediately when the card comes out. And that's this uh, immediate section right here, kind of in purple in the middle. It says place the false messiah on the haven with the most units. Uh, if there are no units on havens, place him on a sea tower. Um, so that's going to be interesting. So as of right now, we don't have any units because we haven't built anything, so he'll just go to a C tower. We can choose where we'd like to place him. I'll probably put him here. So basically, his instant ability kind of trumps what we would have done prior. Um, and I'm going to grab his standee as well. So we've got his standee. We also want to grab a tracker, and it told us to set it to four. Set there. We'll put the Messiah right here. So he's waiting for us if we want to go to a sea tower sea towers are pretty cool because not only can you go there and explore it and get items you can also fast travel to other parts of the world so having this enemy here is good and bad uh you know it's good that we might want to go there and take him out and also use the abilities of that sea tower but bad that he just happens to be waiting for us so that is only one of the two um and then the other one says place one horde at threat four in fog grave so again, we'll pull another one off here. And the one thing you want to notice in these cards, and we'll talk about more about the details on them later, is the top left-hand corner has an initiative. So you can see here the initiative's 13 versus 28. So basically, just to make things simple, we'll put the 13 on this side, put the 28 like this, and we'll be moving these cards around every time we pull out somebody so that we know when we activate them, we got them in order. So we have the Counter of Omens. Uh, this one says place two skeletons on his hex. So no matter where we put this individual, two skeletons are coming out on top of it. So that's going to make things extra fun. Uh, and this one, if I remember correctly, is the Fog Grave. So that's going to be on this side of the board, which actually is interesting because they're going to be potentially decently close together. Um, we'll go ahead and place this one. Kind of want to keep it a little bit further away. So maybe we'll go here. And then this will drop two skeletons in this location as well, unfortunately. Now, skeletons are good, though, because you can take them out and get VP points. And I'll kind of talk you through how we get VP as we go along. But generally, there's a scoring phase at the very end. And skeletons, for instance, you take them out. Or if you take out garrisons, those are other ways to get VP. Quests can give you VP. Uh, anytime you see this jewel symbol, you're basically going to gain some uh, victory points that can move you across the track. So you want to go after those at all costs because they're going to help you out. So the event at this point in time is now complete. Next up is place one activation token on every Horde and Legion card in play. So that would be the two we have right now. So we go ahead and just grab two of the Horde tokens or activation tokens, as I say, for the Horde specific and place them on. This will help us to remember how we're going to activate them. We also don't want to forget it's practice as well for 
counter of omen he's also at four okay and that is going to do it for the events phase so now we're moving into the build phase this is a this is a really exciting phase in that it really starts to focus on the heroes and their factions so we're going to start to draw two cards from our feet deck and we get to pick one of them keep it the other one goes to the bottom so go ahead and draw a card for kyle hopefully not flipping it 30 times and we've got Grave Digger and Bloodlust. And so this one here says, Actions, discard this to gain one item from the market discard, even if you could not use it. So this is actually pretty cool. And one thing I wanted to note about Fenrir, which is I didn't mention earlier, is that he's already got a, he's got a card that allows him to grab items uh, similar to how we talked about in the first chapter event, you know, even if his attributes aren't high enough. So he's got that all the time, which is great. Uh, so this actually, the Grave Digger, kind of cool because it allows you know call to to reach into the market discard and grab things even if he couldn't use it so it's got that kind of power in another way as well um bloodlust this seems pretty good too. discard this to roll the uh the dice of your units that were destroyed here this round so it's giving you almost like an additional ability to roll the dice from the units that were killed off after damage on your hero's hex so that's pretty powerful too because it could help you to take down you know, potentially one of these um, one of these horde characters or something. If things go south and you actually lose a bunch of your units, so I think for Kyle, seeing as that that's one of his specific cards too, it could actually be really good to grab that. Even though I like the Grave Digger, I think I'll just place this on the bottom for now. Go like that, and that's done. Now we come over here to Fenrir, and we're gonna do the exact same thing. See what we got. So we got. Oh, a different type of card here. So you'll see this one. And again, this is kind of a vertical alignment right now. But basically, first thing you do is look in the middle. So if we want to take this one, we would gain three resources and choose which of these two sides we want. And we would gain that particular uh, boost in our abilities for the card for Fenrir. So you can see he's already got one magic, one might, and two guile. But he uh, he could potentially boost one of those other two. That could help him out quite a bit. So I am tempted to go after might. The opposite option is Beastmasters. So Clash, flip this to gain a shield, which is obviously defense for every Beastmaster here. That's also pretty good too, because I probably will likely be building some Beastmasters in the future. We'll be talking more about this board and how it all works very soon in the actions phase and the units. But I think I, think I really want to boost his stats. So I'm going to go ahead and take his might on this one. I'm just going to move his card up like this. And the first thing you want to make sure you don't forget is taking the three resources because that uh, you miss it on things like that. You're going to be sad. We're going to grab this deck from underneath. And then we're going to pick what kind of resources we want. And this kind of starts to trickle into what you're going to do in your actions phase later on in terms of building units. Um, and even honestly coming up in a second, uh, even in the build phase at the very end here, you can see build any units, towers or walls on screen, the bottom left. So knowing what you want to actually gain in resources is actually a very big uh, part of the game strategy wise. So if I'm looking to build some beast masters, say for instance, they're going to cost a lot of food. Uh, there's both, you know, we got sword sisters here. We have cards inside of Fenrir's, uh, you know, pile of feats here that allow him to flip a card to gain a whole bunch of salt for every sword sister. So making a lot of them could be advantageous as well. Uh, so long as they're alive to make use of that. Um, so what I'm going to probably do is boost maybe the food up to, I don't think I'm going to, well, I don't know. This is tough. I might go two on the food and one on the salt. I think we'll do it like that. So that will be the split there. So we're now done with the feats. And at this point in time, we're now going to decide what we want to build for units, towers, and walls from the reserve on any of your havens. So I'll just go over this really quickly. So it says the bond there, max five units per hex. So when you're taking a look at the, an area like this, you know, the max you can have in this area is a total of five units. Um, and it says if you have no haven, choose one uh, explored empty hex. Um, in this case, they'll be all be coming in at the uh, at the Haven. And I can also, as you can see here on the board, you've got tower defenses that can obviously help you out with defending your tower and wall defenses. As soon as you build one of these two things, uh, you're going to have to keep one individual at that location if you decide to move away from that hex in the future because somebody needs to man the place if it's defended. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, but you also want to keep defenses up in the odd case that uh, one of these legions or chaos individuals come or i should say yeah legion or horde individuals come through and want to attack your haven that's never good either um 
So I'll talk quickly about what we've got here on the board. So we'll talk about Kyle first. We have tribesmen. So there's six of them. Dead eyes, wargs, trolls. You can see the number of them right underneath. They talk about whether they're basic or elite. And then they talk about their cost. This is, again, how you'll help to figure out what you need to have resource-wise. For resources at the very top there, I got a counter. So salt is the one blue, red is plunder, and then food is the elephant in green. At the very bottom, the more havens you create throughout the game, the more resources are going to open up to you and allow you to start building more and more things. It just allows you to do a lot more, uh, whether it's building units, trading them in for other resources, trading them in for victory points. There's a bunch of different things you can do with them. So resources are never bad. And havens, putting havens out are also never is never a bad idea. Uh, but you also see dice beside each of these different units. So that's what die will actually come into a clash and or ranged battle uh, in the future when you're actually doing a clash or things like that. So you can see here the different types of dice, no matter what unit you build. And this is kind of where you have to make some smart decisions. So we'll go ahead right now and we'll build as much as we want with Cal and then we'll move over to Fenrir and then we'll get out of the build phase. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build two wargs. So these are fairly costly units, as you can see, but they're going to give us some red dice, which is nice. So it's going to be uh, three salt and two food each, but you'll see that I don't technically have enough salt right now. However, at any point in time, you can do a trade action and you can gain a salt. So I'm going to do that. Now, this is it's costly because, again, I'm spending an action, so I'm limiting what he can do in the actions phase. But it's worth it to me to get two of these out because, as you can see, if I have two wargs up here, this card can trigger giving me additional dice. So I'm not only gaining that extra warg with a red die, I'm gaining a potential to have an orange die in there now, too, which will certainly strengthen me. So we'll go ahead now and we'll knock all of our salt down. We would have had six in there. Uh, down to nothing and then of course our food's going to deplete down to one we'll go ahead and place our wargs right at our haven right here and we're going to come over to uh fenure and i'm going to go ahead and i really like the idea of building sword sisters the reason being is that i've got that card that allow me to flip to gain lots of salt later on so i think i'll build three of them so that's going to be uh three salt and three plunder two three three and we can grab three of them and then the other thing I want to build with them is a Beastmaster as well. So I'll go one, two, three, and drop this by two. And then we have a decent little army here. And I think that's all I want to do. I'm not going to spend anything else on tower defenses right now. I have in the previous plays, I've, I've toyed with that. Now, if I did, like I said, I'd have to bring leaving somebody back there, but it's good for the defense side of things. It, it doesn't cost that much, but the other thing you want to use plunder for and keep an eye out for is that it's good to build havens. You'll see this later when you get to scoring and the and the benefits of having a haven on the board in general is you want to try to have enough plunder to do this. It's not necessary. You don't have to do it, but it's certainly one strategy uh, to gain yourself some more points. Uh, so being able to have the resources to pull that off is good, but you can also explore later into these unexplored areas and gain resources based on what you're trying to go after. So if you really do want more plunder, you can head to these locations or salt and so on. So that's pretty much it. We are now done the build phase and we can now move to the actions phase. And at this point in time, we're starting with calls. So basically how the actions work and I'll talk to you about them at a high level. Well, then we'll do a few with Cal and I'll show you how it moves back and forth. Um, you've got two columns here worth of action. So the first column is the move and trade. You'll see that at the bottom, it says this action does not end your turn. So both of these actions you can do over and over and over again. I could technically burn all six actions for Kyle just doing moving and trading if I really wanted to. Probably wouldn't be the best use of my time, but you could do that, and then his whole actions round would be done. Um, but the other way it typically actually pans out is you'll do maybe a movement or a trade or both, and then once you do one action over here on the right-hand side, that's what stops your turn, and then it moves over to the other faction's turn. When you're playing solo, when you're controlling both factions, it's not as much of a concern, but to ensure that you're not just kind of using all your actions on one faction, the same rules apply. So for this, I basically have to decide how I want to go about spending a couple actions here or as many as I can before I hit one of these ones on the right hand side. So we've got move, it says move your hero to an adjacent hex, even if it's unexplored. So that allows me to basically take my hero and throw him somewhere. Uh, we'll talk more about the specifics of that versus other things later. Trading, you've already seen. Commanding, you pay a food. And you choose an explored hex, which means a hex that is 
was once unexplored and is flipped over to its other side, which means it's now explored. And you can go ahead and move any of your adjacent units and your hero there. So that's really about grouping your guys together, usually for a purpose or trying to bring them somewhere. And then you've got explore, which is what we just mentioned. Exploring is flipping the unexplored tile over. So that's pretty straightforward. Havens, we've talked about this. Pay, you got to pay some resources in order to build a haven. It's actually three. I mentioned it was two earlier, but it's three. Um, and there's some uh, restrictions mentioned there. Market says gain one item from the market that your hero can use. And you have to be able to, uh, you have to be in a location that allows you to do this in the first place. We'll talk about that later. But uh, one good example would be the uh, sea tower, for instance. Um, and then down below it is quest. So choose a quest, roll your hero dice. This is where you use those dice when I upgraded my skills on uh, Fenrir. This is why I kind of did this is because I'm hoping at some point to maybe do some quests over here and you'll see, depending on how successful you are uh, with these quests, you can get some pretty cool benefits. The solve and fail are the big resolves, but if you happen to complete, say for instance, we're doing release the Kraken, it says plus one. That means I just have to be successful at landing either four skulls, two shields, or two bolts, just one of those, uh, and I've got it. And then the benefit is I get the solve, and then if I happen to get the four skulls, I would get two victory points as well. So that's kind of the thing. It's kind of like, it's very nice. If you can actually pull that off, you can actually get some pretty nice uh, things, but some of the quests aren't as easy as just getting one of the categories, sometimes like the other one beside it there. Uh, the Druic, you could see you need to get three skull, or you need to get two of the categories as a two plus. So basically, you need to get three skulls, maybe, and a shield, for instance, in order to pull this off. So you'll see how those work when I actually go ahead and do one. But that's the gist of the quests, um, and that's the gist of the actions and kind of how they work. So at this point in time, let's go ahead with Cal, and let's start doing some actions. So the first thing that Cal is going to do is he wants to get moving, and I want to move to somewhere that's unexplored. I have to make a choice, though, as to kind of where I want to go based on what I'm trying to accomplish. I do have a lot of plunder right now, and I don't have a lot of salt, and salt is something he uses heavily to build his units, so I think I might actually go right up the middle. We're going to go ahead and use an action point on move, and Cal is going to go into this unexplored area, and now we're going to go ahead and immediately flip it over. We'll just go ahead and lock this place. And this is black ice. So it says gain two salt right away, which is pretty awesome. And we'll take a look at what the rest states. It says, if empty, place a skeleton here. So there's a skeleton in this location. Uh, if not, we'd reinforce. We'll talk more about that later if it happens. Uh, then place one skeleton with other skeletons. And then place one activation token on a legion or horde card with, a, with the least tokens. So currently both of them have the exact same amount of tokens. Uh, so to just resolve the act activation one really quick here, I can pick one. Now, in terms of how to decide which one you should pick, this is where it gets interesting. Um, you know, basically think about this as in like, this is where they're going. This is their movement. They're going to be moving, but not just moving. If they can happen to attack and do other things, they will as well based on a priority order. So if you give too many actions to the wrong individual, it could actually cascade and give you some problems, <laughs> but, uh, and you can also technically give them a bunch of points too. Uh, so I think the one that's probably the easiest to give an extra action to right now is probably the Counter of Omens. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I'm saying that just because it's a little further out, it takes a little bit longer for that individual to kind of get into the mix. All right, and the last thing I need to do is to place a skeleton with other skeletons. So, and it's just one, so I can choose here. And the one thing I want to try to avoid is uh, creating kind of a, a giant cluster of skeletons uh, up to three. I don't want that to happen. So. I'm going to go ahead and place it on one of the single skeletons, and I'm probably going to place it on one that's a little bit out of the way. Although, remember that if you take out skeletons, you do get VP points. So putting them too far away, you know, you lose out on that potential option. So I am very tempted to put them on the right-hand side here because I think Kyle will probably head in that direction, being that he likes to fight everything in his path. Um, so I am... Oh, that's a, that's a tough call. I'm... But for the purposes of probably trying to go after the horde individual down here versus going after skeletons, I think I might still play skeletons. So even though I'm juggling that in my mind, I'll settle with this. Okay, so this has now been fully resolved. Uh, we flip this over, and that's considered an explorer too. So that's my other action. And as you can see, that's a right-hand side of the board action. The other thing I want to say is not just before we move over to Fenrir's turn, 
is I mentioned it cost uh, two and three at two different points in the video for a Haven. That's because both the factions technically and, and even the other ones we're not using here uh, will have different costs for the Havens. So you want to keep an eye on that. That's really the only, only major thing inside that actions area that uh, can change. Um, so And there could be other things as well. So keep your eyes on that in terms of paying resources. But uh, that is one thing. Just to be clear that both of them have different costs for those Havens. All right, so we've now done Cal's turn. We can move over to Fenrir. And what does Fenrir want to do? Fenrir's got a decent-sized army, that's for sure. Uh, the garrison's sitting here at level one, and I'm pretty tempted to go over there and just, you know, try to do something about that. So I think I'm going to take Fenrir. I'm going to head him south directly in. So let's go ahead and move. We'll get Fenrir right in there. And then I'm just going to go ahead and flip this tile over. We'll see what we got. Now, this is the other thing to mention I want to talk about, because this one didn't have anything special on the outside of the of the hex but when i flip this you do have the ability to orientate the tile any way you want when i did this with cal for black ice it doesn't matter because there's no restrictions on the outside of the uh, location in other words there's no blockages of the pass to get to any other hexes whereas the one i just flipped you can see there's these it looks like teeth but they're essentially like mountains a mountain range that basically blocks you from basically getting to that hex. you'd have to go around take the long ways around so as soon as you resolve this, or as soon as you flip it over and explore it, you're able to flip this to whichever orientation you want. So it's actually a good time to do this, because as you can see, I've already kind of blocked off my units behind me from being able to command into this route, into this area uh, in the future. So I definitely want to kind of move this thing around to where it works for me. So seeing as all the action appears to be most likely coming from this right-hand side currently, I think I'm going to open it up like this. Um, now, I am missing out on a lot of salt by doing that, and it's going to be a long ways around kind of situation, but that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, the other thing that's a plus for Fenrir is that salt's not too much of a concern because Fenrir does have this, which I plan to use in a few seconds to generate some salt. Um, so basically, we moved into this uh, area here, but first, let's go ahead and deal with what's on this. So it says gain to plunder for going in there. Pretty nice. Bump ourselves up there. Remove any skeletons that are here. There are none. We're going to place two garrisons. Yikes. Okay, so this is going to be a problem because we're at garrison level one. This is now going to present the second level on top and then... stuff like that that'll be good my units can come in and hopefully make quick work of it um and then it says oh place two garrisons on empty hexes with no x so in this particular situation how that's going to work is all of the ones that don't have an x are really the ones that actually have an x are all around the outside so it's all these unexplored areas here where do we want to put our garrisons uh no technically we can even put them on these locations here i could even put it where i currently am but i don't want to boost that up um so i think i'm just going to build them off to the sides here. Uh, I think what I'll do is Cal Light is probably going to be strong enough to deal with level one garrison. So I'm going to put the garrisons on his side. And this is also going to help to prevent, or at least help to um, push some of these enemies into garrisons where they're going to have to battle each other. These guys don't like each other at all. So they will fight each other. So putting them in advantageous positions can sometimes be a good thing. And that'll be it because that is an explore action as well. We only have one action left, and I'm hoping to... This is going to be an interesting thing with him, as I was hoping to get a uh, actual haven out, but it looks like we're going to have to just command, bring the people in, take down the garrison, and live without a haven for his turn. But moving back over to Cal, we've got two actions remaining. So what do I want to do? Probably, probably head into one of these locations and maybe do some attacking. I don't want to be too far away from my havens, uh, but at least I got two, so that's a plus. I'll probably head to the plunder area, I think. So we can boost that up. Um, Salt-wise, could be good too, though, for building dead eyes. That could be helpful. Actually, you know what? Let's do that. Let's actually head up to here. So we're going to bring Cal up to here with a move. And 
I'm going to show you guys questing, I think, in the next round. Oh, this one is safe to be placed here. So this one's gain two salt, which is what I was trying to get a little bit more salt on him for later rounds. If empty, place two skeletons here as well. So skeleton and a skeleton. And then it says place two skeletons with other skeletons. Oh, okay. So that's going to cause a little bit of a problem. So when you have to place two skeletons with another skeleton, then uh, in this case, this would be the best one to put it on probably. <clears throat> Unfortunately though, it's going to then turn into something a little bit scarier. And one correction I want to make before we go forward is right here. I'm going to blame the garrison. It's probably my fault though. It says uh, if empty, place two skeletons here. So this wasn't empty as there was a unit there, which was the garrison. So these skeletons actually do not go here. Uh, so what we're going to focus on now is the placing of two skeletons with other skeletons. So I could take the two skeletons I now have to place and separate them and place them with other skeletons around or I could put two of them together. So I'm going to actually lump them as far away as possible and kind of keep them in a group over here. But there's something that happens when you get three or more skeletons in one space. So what's going to happen is we're going to have this skeleton come into play. We'll have another skeleton come into play. And once there's three in one spot, then the three skeletons then go away and it changes out and you draw a chaos horde card, which brings another individual into play. You can see the, initi the initiative on this one is 26. So we'll just go ahead and move this down like this. This will be activating second. We're gonna need a tracker on this one as well. And we'll grab this individual who's gonna show up at this location too. So that's, we've got like a full assault happening here on the east side at this point now. Um, so it's going to be quite interesting. And uh, as of right now, this doesn't have any activation tokens. That's probably the only positive. Uh, all right. So that is going to be Cal's last uh, action there was to explore. And we've resolved that now. So we definitely have, as I mentioned, quite a bit of action going over here. We have one action left uh, for a Fenrir. So Fenrir wants to take down a garrison. So we're going to go ahead and do a command action. going to bring all the units in. We'll spend one food. I'll actually take my action point here. And we have zero left. We're going to grab all of the units we're going to drop them into this location and this is going to trigger a battle so we're going to do our first battle against the garrison do i have any ranged units no but i do have a bow so i can pay one to get an orange die so i'm certainly going to do that so i'll get an orange die the garrison is only level one so taking a look at this level one down here they do have a range of one white die so it's going to be an orange versus a white for this first archery phase of battle. I'm hoping I can pull this off. Yep. Looks like I got one hit and that's it. Actually, we don't have to go into a clash because the archery was enough to take down the garrison itself. So that's huge. So I don't use any or lose any units. I also don't want to forget to take the victory point for taking down that garrison. And that's really good. So now I'm hoping to be strong enough in the future to go after the Messiah. We'll see how this pans out. Um, but that is it. All of the actions on both sides have now been completely depleted. So we move on to the next phase. So Nemesis phase is next. So we're activating legions and hordes once for each activation token on them in initiative order, lowest to highest. So we're going to initiate the counter of omens first two activation tokens to go with him. So that is right here. So we really just want to reference this sheet right here on the screen. The far left, you'll see activating a legion. Um, so, or I should say activating a horde, um, and it says remove an activation token. So we'll do that first. We'll move that just to keep track of what we are doing. And we're going to place a curse here. So one curse is going to show up this location. Curses are bad. It's going to give victory points to more of those that are lingering around on the board. Um, and they also have in-game effects on what you're potentially able to do in that location when that's cursed. So it also bad that front too. Um, then in the horde, or I should say this um, individual from the horde is going to move uh, not further from the capital. So basically moving at least towards it or keeping even with the distance uh, to a certain priority of a hex with a haven is the first one. So we look around us, there's no hex with a haven in the first three spaces or three hexes around us. Uh, a hex with the fewest amount of enemy units, that doesn't exist either. An empty hex, that actually does exist. We do have two empty hexes. So technically one of these two. Um, and I can choose at this point which one I want to place them in. So for me, I want to bring this individual probably closer to Cal. So Cal has the ability to take him out in the future. So I'm going to put him here. And that's going to just resolve one of the activations. And then we're going to do it again. So this activation token will go away. 
another curse is going to land right here. Curses are dropping everywhere. And then again, we have to decide which way we're going here. We have two garrisons now. But first, if we take a look at the horde, it says a hex with a haven. So not that a hex with the fewest enemy units. So it won't be this one, although technically the hero, it, it doesn't count as an actual unit. So it only sees the two garrisons. and They're both equal. So I can choose which of these two I want to go to. So it makes sense for me to bring him here and have him attack this garrison with me in that space. Later, I can command my units in and hopefully we can finish off that individual. So we'll do this. Second, they walk in. This is automatically going to trigger a battle. So the battle is going to happen between the counter of omens and the garrison. So we go to a ranged or I should say an archery round. So we have one white up against, and we take a look here based on the threat tracker of four, we are at three white. So one white versus three white. This is not looking good for the garrison. See how this pans out. All right, so we got ourselves a show. Oh, wow. So a great roll on uh, the counter of omens. He was able to block uh, any damage coming through from the garrison, which is unfortunate for us because I was hoping the garrison could do something uh, through to it, but didn't. The garrison is now gone and yellow gains a point. So we'll move them up on the track as well. So that's kind of not really what I wanted to happen. I was hoping, like I said, that some damage would have knocked the threat down to make the fight easier for me later. But uh, it is what it is. Okay, so next up in initiative order is the Banished. And this is one thing I need to uh, mention that I missed is when we first put the Banished out, which didn't happen that long ago, the first thing you need to do is check to make sure you do the banner in the middle in the purple. It says immediate. So let's just do this right now. We're doing this out of turn, but the we can resolve this without any game impact. Uh, but this is something, again, whether you see it on any card, you always want to make sure you do these immediate effects right away. This is pretty easy. It just says set the Banished threat to five. So basically his threat goes up to five. Um, and then choose one quest and resolve its failure effect. So we're going to take a look at quest for the first time. And unfortunately, you guys don't get to see <laughs> the quest resolve in a positive way yet. But hopefully in chapter two, I'll push for that. Um, we've got three different quests here. Uh, the fail condition on each of them is pretty nasty. So this one down here for Kraken says place one curse on a hex with no X. So the downside of doing this is once a curse is on the board, it's going to count as a victory point for whatever, for however many chapters it's sticking around. So basically that's like giving them, if I'm playing two chapters, two points. So that's not nice. Uh, Chaos gains two points for this other one. That's also not nice. Uh, losing a point for me isn't nice, but it's certainly, I guess, less harmful potentially than the other two. So I'm actually going to go ahead and lose a point. So Cal will be taking that one point. We're going to have to also get rid of that quest that's there as well. So I'll deal with that in a second. First, for now, let's get these out of the way. Cal's going to go back to zero. And then we'll bring these ones over here like this. Okay, so this one right here is going to be discarded. And you don't draw another one right now. Later on, they get replenished. Okay, so let's head over here. Are we activating the Banish, though, when we were doing the activations phase here for the Nemesis phase? Are we actually activating the Banish? No, there's no activation tokens on it. It came in late, so we don't have to worry about that. We move down to the False Messiah, who has two activation tokens. So this is going to be unfortunate for us as well. Uh, the False Messiah is right here. So the order of operations, seeing as there's two hexes with uh, enemy units in it, says the hex with the fewest enemy units. So it's actually going to head itself into here, which is great because it's going to have a battle now with this garrison. And hopefully it will, the garrison will actually do some damage against it. So the Messiah here has a total of, at a threat level of four, two white dice. And then we'll be going up against a garrison that has, um, for range, two white dice. So it's two and two to start. So very even. And then hopefully later on, inflict some damage here. Okay, so the garrison ended up getting two shields of blocking everything but putting a damage through, which was also blocked. So that entire attack of range or archery did nothing, but the clash now begins. So we're going to go ahead and just so you're clear, at the very top uh, rolls are going to be for the, uh, uh, for the Messiah. So the Messiah's roll is a purple, red, blue, and white. So... That would be purple, red, blue, and white. And we'll roll those in advance. And then we're going to have the garrison going to be rolling a blue, orange, orange, and a white. Yikes, that was quite the attack from the Messiah. So one thing that I forgot to mention about the false Messiah just before I roll those dice is that being that he's in a space with a haven or garrison when during a clash, he gets a red die. You can see it there on the left in the middle. So I'm going to add one red die to the roll going to make things really interesting. 
That's a blank. Okay, so in terms of the garrison, the garrison made one attack against the False Messiah, which was blocked, so nothing going through. Uh, but then in terms of the False Messiah, did a whole bunch of damage way past what the uh, the garrison was able to handle. So this garrison is out of here. So that's very unfortunate. So two points of uh, two points for the board up to three. And just like that, that's been resolved. So I was hoping the False Messiah was going to get hit twice there and it didn't happen this time around. But uh, so he's still just as strong as he was when he started, but he's not even done yet. Um, so at this point in time, he's now going to activate for the second time. And at this point in time, we are now sitting in an area with lots of action. Now, just before I decide where I want to place some side, because I do have the choice uh, out of all the hexes that are around here, the one to the south doesn't have any actual units inside of it that are enemy units. Um, and then over here to the above to the north, there's too many. I've got a whole bunch uh, more than the garrisons here that only have three. And these are our enemies. So definitely we get a choice between one of these two spots. Um, the capital is quite an entertaining spot to place one of these uh, individuals because if the uh, chaos uh, heads into this area, uh, there's going to be kind of a battle that's going to be going on for quite some time and it's quite entertaining. So I think I'm going to probably do that, move them in there. But before I do, I also want to just correct the fact I didn't place a curse on the uh, tile at the beginning of his activation that would have stayed where he or would have landed where he currently was. So there's a curse now at the unexplored sea tower. So he's going to move now into the capital. And again, once he moves, he's going to put another curse right here. So now he's inside the capital and the battle is going to begin. This is going to be big because this is the first three level garrison we've done. So it's going to be three white. I'll put the, uh, the garrison at the bottom here and then I'll put them up first. And then for him being the uh, Messiah, Messiah with a four is going to have two white dice. And actually, there'll be a little bit of an addition there because of the garrison. So one red die as well for the false messiah to add to the pile. So I'll pull that out separately. Roll that as well. Similar to what we did last time. Okay, so we got uh, three hits, two hits, and a shield. So three hits coming through is going to wipe out the garrison. No, it's not. It'll wipe out two levels of the garrison. Um, and then on... The other side of things, two hits against the Messiah. So that's actually pretty good. So the Messiah's going to drop down to two. Two levels of the garrison are going to disappear. We'll drop those over there. And that's not bad. So, I mean, he's definitely weak, uh, but who's going to win this is anyone's bet at this point. So now we got to go through another round of a clash here. Um, so you can see at the bottom of the capital mentions if there are only non-imperial units here place one legion here if if you can flip this hex so essentially right now the garrison is going to still continue to attack the false messiah but if the garrison does get taken out and the false messiah is still here then it's going to get interesting as the imperial legion is going to start releasing individuals into this space that's going to result in epic battles continuing against the messiah uh, which is probably going to be bad for them um, so we're going to go ahead now and do a garrison level one uh, archery attack here. So that'll be a one white die. And we'll just double check the Messiah's thing because that only triggers the clash for the red. Yes. So one white die for the garrison down below and the Messiah with a level two threat is only going to get two white dice. So a shield on the garrison side of things. And a blank. Okay, so nothing on the archery. Yeah. So the Messiah is going in with two blues and a white, but also a red. And then the garrison is just a level one garrison, so a blue and a white. So two hits coming from the Messiah and the garrison defends one of them. So one hit through is enough to take out the last garrison. So that is out of here. Chaos goes up another point. All right, and one thing I want to correct is about the point scoring. So this is for Chaos. You can see I've got it up to four, and I have been giving them points for all of the uh, the garrisons that have been taken down, but these points don't come into play uh, until we actually get to the scoring round, and we'll talk more about that later. I was kind of playing the scoring track for them like I was playing it for uh, one of my factions. Uh, so they actually are sitting at zero. Uh, they are not up at five, but you'll see later how everybody jumps ahead when we hit to the scoring phase. Uh, based on what's going on in those graveyards. 
And there's rules specific to that as well. So we have gone ahead. The Messiah has successfully cleared out the garrison here. And you can see now that there is no, or there's uh, only non-Imperial uh, units in this location. Uh, we have to place uh, a Legion here, which means we're pulling a Legion card from the deck and flipping it over. We got the Executioner. So the Executioner is coming in. The threat level currently is based on the event. You can see over here, uh, the event is uh, four threat in the bottom left-hand corner. So the tracker stays at four place like that we also want to make sure we do the uh, immediate trigger which says place her target every player places one elite unit from play or the reserve in the imperial graveyard so just before we do that let's go ahead and get the standee and the target so we know that the executioner is coming out in the capital right next to the messiah where they're going to be battling it out and in terms of a target here we have to choose, uh, we're going to be choosing the, the Haven with the least amount of units. Uh, and in this case, we have two Havens uh, that have no units. So I'm going to go ahead and place the target over here. That will sit right there. And now we're going to go ahead and resolve that immediate effect. So we make sure we do that correctly. So every player places one elite unit from play or the reserve in the graveyard. I think I'm going to let the troll go to the graveyard. Um, and this is going to go in the Imperial graveyard. And then the same thing over here. I have to choose an elite unit. Now I could, again, I can take one off the board, but I, I really don't want to do that. Um, so I think I'll take a ranger and we'll place a ranger uh, up here in the graveyard as well. That'll satisfy that immediate trigger. So then we, we are, even though we're done our actions with our factions we're controlling, this battle is still ensuing here between the false messiah and the executioner. So we're going to do our first uh, round of, of archery. So we know with the Messiah here, if we take a quick look, uh, there is no more garrison. So we don't have to deal or worry about uh, the red die anymore. But on the Executioner, uh, it says gain one purple if there is a target here. Uh, there isn't a target at this location, so she doesn't gain that. Um, so we don't have to worry about those this time around. Uh, the Messiah is going to go in with a level two, so a little, quite a bit weaker. So two white dice for the Messiah. We'll put the Messiah at the top. And then we're going to have the Executioner, who's a lot healthier, a lot stronger, with a blue and two white. All right, so complete miss from the Messiah. And one hit from the Executioner. So Messiah is now down to one. This is not looking too good. So now we're going into our Clash round. So we take a look at one for the False Messiah. It's going to be a blue and two whites. And if we take a look at the Executioner, still at four, a black, a purple, and two orange. Oh, this is bad news. This is bad news for the Messiah. <laughs> Messiah is not going to be able to handle this. Nope, nope, nope. So the Messiah is out of here. Um, so we're going to return the Messiah. Gone. Uh, we've satisfied the bottom portion of this hex, and the capital's kind of been restored uh, and doesn't have any uh, enemy units sitting in there. Um, so that's going to do it. That's going to end the activation run of all of these characters. Uh, the False Messiah is also gone off the board from here so we are now moving past the nemesis phase so we're into the production phase so gain resources based on your total havens um, so right now you can see down here based on what we built up we've got two havens total so we gain one salt one plunder and then four food and then we come over here to the other side for our fenure and we got three salt one two three and one food and then gain resources shown on every hex with one of your havens. So we come over here and we look for a call first. He's got two salt plus one of each. So three salt and then one, one, so one, two, three, and then one, one. We come over here to uh, Fenrir, see what we've got for a haven over here. We've just got one of each because wasn't able to build the other haven. I was hoping to do but it didn't pan out. And that's going to be it for the production phase. Now we're moving over to the scoring phase. Okay, so we do this per different factions. So we'll start with the Empire. So the Empire is going to get one for every hex with a garrison. So we got one, two, three, four. So we'll go ahead and grab their token and move them up to four. And then one for every Legion in play. So we currently have one card for them in play. So again, if we take down like the execution for instance, we can stop these points from accumulating chapter by chapter, right? These are the this is what it, this is what really matters when you're playing the game in terms of strategizing on how to prevent the points from coming in for these uh, different factions. And then two for every faction in the Imperial Graveyard. And currently there is two factions in there, so they're going to gain four points. They're going to jump up to nine. 
And also something worth mentioning in terms of the Imperials is that they were able to take out the False Messiah, and when the False Messiah's card went away, you technically do this the second they're destroyed, but I'll do it right now while we're resolving the Imperials' scoring. It says we gain, uh, or they gain, three victory points. They're going to actually jump up on the track from nine up to 12. All right, so now we're heading into the Chaos. So Chaos has got curses. We got one, two, three, four, five, six curses total. So they're going to jump from where they're currently at up to six. And then we've got one for every horde in play. So we currently have two of them. And then it's going to be two for every faction in the Chaos Graveyard. So we only have one faction in there right now. So it's just going to be two points. And then it comes over to us. So we're going to start with Call here. So it says two for each of their Havens in play. So thankfully I have two Havens. So it's going to jump me up to four. And then we get special hexes. So special hexes basically means like if you have to have one of these VPs on one of the hexes with a Haven, we get that point. So I get one. And then one to any player per five resources paid. So this is where it gets interesting. Now, I'm going to wait until, because I'm playing two chapters, I'm going to wait until the end of the second chapter to probably uh, unload resources to try to boost my points up. Um, but that's something you can do, is to really bring in all kinds of resources and then convert those resources into victory points to boost yourself off the track. But for now, I want to be sure that I can do what I need to do, so I'll skip on that. And we'll come over to uh, Fenrir. So Fenrir here, uh, two for each haven, so only one haven in play, so going from one to three. Um, and then for special hexes, again, just the one, the, the base hex that's on, that gives one victory point. And then again, I could go ahead and ditch a whole bunch of resources to boost me further, but I will not. So currently right now, we are trailing quite heavily, and the, the enemies are spreading across the board uh, pretty aggressively in this play. Uh, very different, actually, than a play I did myself, too. So it changed, the, the strategy changes uh, really fast in this one, which is why it's so exciting. It's like some games, the... Uh, They'll jump out at you sometimes, and other times you'll feel like you're jumping on them. Um, but there's always that strategy going on as to what you can do next. The next phase shows up uh, is Omens, but this is specific to the expansion. And so we're not covering this in this particular video series. So we'll jump right past this and head right back to the refresh phase. So at this point, we're picking a Druid card. Now you'll actually see the refresh phase fully go through because we're actually refreshing at this point. Um, I've got three unrevealed Druid cards around the map, so I'm just going to go ahead and pick one and flip it over. So we'll go with this one way over here. Um, it says, uh, for a bolt on a die during Archer and Clash, place one of your units from any graveyard in any explored hex without enemy units. Okay, that's actually, it could be useful. It could be useful. Um, and then right now, flip all of your face down cards back up. So the only ones that I actually flipped face down was Fenrir's one here, so this will flip back up. We want to regain all of our action points. So, and we've got our eight points ready to go and then deal three new items. So we we get a whole new set of items. So we can discard this, this, and this and draw three new items. So what do we got here? We got the Deepling Glow Shroom. When you discard one feet, you may discard this item. The Horn, when you use the command action, pay zero. Oh, that's kind of nice. You're not paying as much food for that one. Um, and then clash. Wow, the harpoon. You may turn one of your dice to show one's oh, that's kind of that's pretty powerful too. Interesting items. Um, and then going to the quest, so deal three new quests. You can see we got a blank one because we actually had one discarded when we had trigger a fail condition. These ones are now discarded, and we're gonna pull three new quests. So we've got this one here that is going to that's not bad. It's going to give us some resources and things like that based on what we've rolled. This one's removing all activation tokens from one horde and discarding the quest. And the last one is choosing a hex with a curse. Remove that curse and discard this quest. So curses we've seen all around the board. And this is this is one of the ways you can actually get rid of curses. You don't go to a curse and actually fight it. Uh, but there's cards within the game that allow you to, to deal with curses. So this is one way we could potentially do that. One other thing to make mention is a Corrupted Druid quest has an immediate action, so we have to do this right away. Uh, it says place one activation token on the Horde deck. The next Horde you draw gets that token, and then place one curse on any empty hex. So first off, the Horde deck being over here, we're just going to grab an activation token and place it on top. So it just helps us to remember that when we grab the next uh, card, it's going to come in with a token. Um, and then we want to place a curse on an empty hex. So I'm going to actually place it here to avoid one more curse from being placed. Um, 
Yeah, that'll work well. If you do that, you kind of avoid the fact because when these things activate later on, they'll move and then they'll place a curse. But if there's already a curse there, they won't place another one. So that can actually save you. All right, so I'll do that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll run with that one. So that is going to be it for the quests. And now we pass the first player token over. So we'll basically just start with uh, uh, Fenrir this, this round and over to the events phase. So add two threats to everybody in play. This is going to make people that much more aggressive. Just slightly scary. Um, the first player draws and reads the next event. So this is uh, Fenrir doing this. We'll grab the event, see what we got. If a druid showed worth of a god, would bestow upon them a portion of their powers and were called the god touched. Every player may place one of their feats from play on this card face down. If your feet is here, you can use bolts on a hex with a curse. Okay, because curses will stop you from using uh, your bolts, uh, which we haven't seen yet, but those bolts uh, are definitely useful. They can help you to break shields as well. Um, but in this case, the question is, do I want to really get rid of any cards in order to, you know, have the ability to use bolts on curse spaces? We do have quite a few curses leaking their way into our area here. Um, but to be completely honest, I'm not too concerned about it at this point. And I really like the cards that I have. So I think I'm going to leave that alone, at least on Call's side. And I think for Fenrir, I'm going to... Yeah, I'm pretty happy with these three. I don't think there's any reason to do that. So I'll leave that alone. Uh, the Imperial Inquisition claims to have brought peace to Azul uh, and hunt those who have or who would upset the Great Dormancy. Next on the list, we are going to place three garrisons on an empty hex with no X. So I'm going to take a look here and likely place these garrisons over here on the unexplored sea tower. So we'll put a level one and on top of that, a two. And finally, a three. Uh, next up, I want to mention a couple things that I did uh, change and want to talk about in terms of the graveyard and feet cards. So first off, the graveyards, you'll notice, are now empty. Uh, this is something that technically, even though we're in the events phase right now, I should have actually emptied out the graveyards at the end of the scoring phase. So I'll show you that in the bottom left hand corner. You'll see at the bottom of the scoring phase, it says return all units from the graveyards to the reserve. You want to make sure you do this at the end of every single scoring phase, because obviously by leaving units in the graveyard, the next time you come around to the scoring phase, you're going to only be hurting yourself. That resolves that. The other thing I want to mention is the discard pile for feats. So you'll notice that I had a discard pile going for my character, but technically these cards, the feet cards, actually go face down underneath deck. Uh, you don't shuffle the deck, you just place them underneath, and that's it. So there never is a discard pile for the feet deck for each of these two factions. Um, and the other thing to note is if you have an item card in your hand and you use it, you might think you put it into a discard pile next to your character or something like that, but you actually put it in the discard pile for the items, which there is a place for up here. So I've already done that, which is why you can now see the dragon fruits up here, which is something that Cal used earlier on. So with all that said, we can head back to the, uh, the event card. And the next thing we're going to be doing is placing a legion at threat five on the sea tower. So let's go ahead and draw a legion card. So we got the warlock initiative of five. We're also going to grab the warlock and the warlock is going to go on the sea tower over here and then taking a look at the legion here in terms of the tracker uh it's going to be placed uh the target on one faction haven with the least units so this target is going to end up going on cal's haven and the reason is that you can't have two targets on the same haven so this is kind of an automatic in this case so now that we have the Warlock situated at the very front of, uh, in terms of the initiative order, and the threat is all resolved, we're ready to go on to the next uh, piece. And it says, place one horde at threat five on an empty space, or an empty hex with no X. So the horde card obviously is gonna have this activation token we put on top of the deck from before. We got the blood worm. And uh, the other thing to note too, I don't want to forget is the instant uh, or immediate effect for the warlock that we just put out. So we're placing his target, but we all have to pay a single salt for each of our havens. So we don't want to forget that. So we're going to be taking a two salt hit for Cal, and we're going to be taking a one salt hit for Fenyor. Those immediate effects will always get you. So keep your eye on those. Uh, 21 initiative is going to have it placed pretty much right in the center. So activation token sits on top. 
And this is going to come in, I believe, dated at five. Tick it up to a five. And that, again, typically matches the threat level on the card itself as well. It also mentions it in the writing, too. The effect on this one is place one curse on any hex with no X. So maybe this spot right here isn't a bad one. So we're going to place the curse right there. The uh, placing of activation tokens now occurs across all of these different Legion and uh, Horde units. So we'll go ahead and grab one token here. Another token here. We'll have, end up having two on the Blood Worm. One banished and one for the Executioner. That is going to do it for the events phase. And now we're moving into our build phase. Let's go ahead and draw two feats from our deck and we get to keep one of them. So the first one I got here is Magic and Might. And the second one is Blank. This one uh, isn't loading in. So I'm just going to go ahead and flip that over. We'll put that to the bottom and we'll take another one. And we got ourselves. Ah, okay, this one has to do with trade. Kind of leaning more towards, and one of the reasons I might be leaning more towards this one for a skill boost on Cal is because there's some pretty interesting quests going on in here that got pulled up, and I think I'm going to be doing his... Well, we'll see if we can pull off some of these. So maybe boosting his stats is the right thing to do. Now, in terms of which die I really want to go with, purple... Well, let's go with purple. Let's do with the magic. I think that's a good call, So. Put Cal like this. We also don't want to forget the immediate effect. So it says when you gain this, gain three resources. So in terms of resources right now, we are kind of hurting on the salt a little bit uh, if we want to build up a little bit more of an army. And to get out the warg is going to be three. Some of the archers are going to be two each. So yeah, let's do... Let's bump this to nine. Although one thing to keep an eye on is, again, the haven cost for his faction is three. So getting out some havens if i happen to clear this i could place one more so i should be okay there i think i'm happy with that so we'll place that like that and then this card here again like i said before this goes right on the bottom of the deck if there's no discard pile so we'll just go like this all right and then we're heading over to venure and venure's gonna pull two cards we got informants and oh look at that we got ourselves a boost on the dice as well here so I'm going to go ahead and actually take this one right here for leadership. So we'll move Fenrir up like this. And we also get to gain three resources as well. Stack these like so. I also have one correction to make that I'll talk about in a second. In terms of what I want to boost up, definitely I think salt. Because uh, there's a heavy salt requirement for uh, Fenrir. Even though I do have the Sword Sisters, I actually may not need as much salt as I think I need potentially the well there's there's they're pretty expensive let's do it let's get the salt get as much salt as we can um what I wanted to correct is over here you'll see when I did the placing of one legion at threat five on a sea tower empty if possible you have to place this target on the capital I placed the target uh, down here so even though technically if I had to choose between the havens this would be the correct one to choose it tells us to place on the capital so it should be there. Again, there's no gameplay impact there, so no worries about breaking anything. Grabbing this, putting it on the bottom, and we're good to go. So that is going to resolve the drawing of two feet. Okay, so next up, uh, we're going to be able to build any units, towers, or walls from the reserve on any of your havens. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll start off with Fenrir. So for Fenrir, I'm going to go ahead and build the Beastmaster. So that's going to be two salt, three food, and this Beastmaster is going to come in at the Haven. That is all I'm going to build. Now, if I was playing a longer chapter game to chapter four, I'd probably build some more stuff. But my plan here is to use resources to my advantage at the end, potentially to uh, gain more victory points. Uh, so we'll see how that pans out. But this will allow me to get uh, this last Beastmaster in with the army I already have with Fenrir, which is the group max of five later. Um, and then I can kind of, you know, have an army if I need it. Uh, maybe we could even potentially go down after a garrison. But my biggest plan is going to be to clear curses and place havens. So uh, that's why I'm not kind of bolstering my armies too, too much with him at this point. Now, for Kyle here, we've got two havens. I know I'm going to want to bring the wargs in because for sure we're going after the counter of omens. So I want to bolster what I can do. Uh, in that side of things. And technically, Cal's going to be in a place where he can also build a uh, haven. So I want to make sure that I have the resources for that. So I have three plunder. So I'll be able to do that Haven build later. 
Um, the good thing is that I don't need plunder to build any units, so I can technically go after something pretty aggressive. So I could potentially even go after the 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 troll, which could be interesting. Um, or I could even uh, add some archers into the mix too. So if I go with the troll, this one might be drop this by five, and I'll knock this down by two. We'll build the troll, and I will also build maybe two of the smaller units, so it doesn't cost as much resource-wise. I think the archers are pretty good. Let's go with that. Um, yeah, let's go with two archers. Okay, and that's about all I want to spend with Cull. So bring these units in, and these guys are going to all end up on this haven here. We'll have a little army ready to go. Um, in terms of building up anything on tower defenses or wall defenses for either of these, I'm pretty safe right now. Like, I don't have anybody nearby that I need to worry about that. And I plan to attack anyone that's even within one anyway. So I don't really think I'm going to spend any resources on that. So that's going to do it in terms of building uh, the build phase. So now we move into the action phase. We're starting with uh, Fenrir over here. So the first thing I want to do, just looking at where we're currently at, is build a haven because we're in a space that we own. There's nothing else here preventing us from doing so. So let's go ahead, spend an action. And we're going to pay two and we're going to drop a haven here. It's going to help us in the scoring side of things. And that's going to end his turn. That's pretty quick. Coming over here to uh, Call. We know we want to do an attack, and we're going to be doing an attack on the counter of omens. So we're going to be doing a command to get all of our units in here. We're going to, have to pay a food to do that. Definitely worth it. And we're going to bring all these units right here into the fray. And I'll, some of these won't sit perfectly. Uh, wait, there's one that toppled over on me. Okay, and we are in a location, uh, terrain-wise, that there's no effect, so we don't have to worry about anything uh, you know, additional, but we should take a look at the Counter of Omens just to see once we are now engaging in a fight if anything is going to hurt us. So this individual, when he gets bolts, is going to place two skeletons on any empty hex, and that's after damage. It only happens once uh, per round. Okay, so here's hoping I can just you know dismiss this character quite quickly, but uh, it does have uh, six on the threat, which is pretty aggressive. Okay, so we're going into an archery uh, battle. So because I have two wargs, I do get a orange die on top of whatever else I have here. And I have uh, orange and two whites. So I'm just going to roll my dice first, and then we'll roll the other one next. So the counter of omens has, with a threat of six, this is kind of scary, four white dice. So I'm really hoping for lots of blanks here. We got a shield so we can protect ourselves. We got one hit and... Okay, a complete even archery round there. So everything was blocked that was sent both ways. Okay, so we're going into a clash now. And uh, I'm hoping uh, I can do pretty good because we got three purple, a blue, and an orange coming our way. Kind of aggressive. And then on our side, we have a black, two reds, two whites. That's actually not bad for them. They only got uh, two through, but you can see they did get a bolt. Oh, that's not good. Okay, so we don't lose a ton of units, uh, but we didn't do a ton of damage. We do actually get one through, so that's nice. So one gets through, hits the counter of omens, uh, and then they get two on us, which is kind of painful. Uh, so we're going to probably, well, we're definitely going to lose our, our archers, and these are going to go into the chaos graveyard. There's those two. There is a bolt that triggers at this point uh, because uh, the Counter of Omens is not a friendly individual. Uh, he's going to place two skeletons on any empty hex. So let's just place these skeletons uh, maybe as far away as possible. It can even be an, a space with an X. Um, I could technically place them somewhere where maybe my army can actually get some VP off of them. So if I have a plan to head into one of these two spaces with Fenrir, I might actually place the skeletons... Uh, in here however i think it needs to be empty yeah and there's a curse there so technically they can't be placed in either of these spots uh what i could do though is i think i'll just place them off to the side for now then be nice to go after them but i don't think i'm going to be able to actually take them out based on my plan to put a lot of havens down and explore this side of the board and clearing curses so that's that we're going into the next round of the clash uh the counter of omens now is at five so we're going with a two purples, two blues, and an orange. And then for me, I don't have as many dice as I had before. Black and two reds. Still powerful dice, though. Um, 
but not as many. Oh my, this isn't good. This is not good. Okay. Oh, wow. I got a lot of damage on that for a very small roll. Okay. So those two shields basically make my red die uh, useless, but I did get two through. So we'll knock the counter of omens down by two. Um, and then on their side, they end up doing three back to me, which I can't defend. And that is going to wipe out my entire army. Plus, uh, I have a bolt, but let's just see what that bolt does for us. So over here, we have something that says ignore all uh, skulls showing on one die your enemy rolled. I mean, that's not bad. That'll that'll actually save one of my units. So let's let's use that bolt to trigger that, which means I can keep my troll and that will give me one extra round of battle. Um, so we've already knocked him down to three, so he's a little bit a little bit less painful. And there's no bolts here either for for him to trigger anything. So now we're going into the next round of clash. I'm on my last legs here. So three, let's see, we got a purple, two blue, and an orange. And for me, it's just a black. So I need some, I need some serious magic to occur at this point. Uh, this is going to kill me. And there we go. So, oh, so close. Getting down there, not enough, but very close. So that is going to kill off my troll. And there goes that army. Gone. So you can see that the, the battle has turned against me. Um, so that didn't work out exactly as I planned, uh, but we did command the whole units in. So that is going to resolve the battle completely. And we can now move over to Fenrir's turn. One thing I just caught and I definitely want to make use of is the Bloodlust card over here. Now, this card allows me, uh, it says, to discard this to roll the dice of your units that were destroyed here this round. Now, technically, you would use this card and trigger it right after you lose uh, the units that you want to roll. So I just lost the troll in that battle. Uh, so technically, based on timing, I would have to roll the black die, but I had forgotten that I had this card and it's not going to make a major impact in gameplay to re-roll the two red dice of the two units that I lost just in the round prior to that. So just so you guys understand, right now, the Counter of Omens has only two damage left, but that's including the one damage the troll did. So we're going to go ahead and roll two red and see if we can actually pull off killing this thing. So it should be pretty exciting. The only way that the troll can actually stay alive uh, is if we land three damage, because that would have been the current uh, amount of threat that the counter of omens would have had at that time. We'll see if that pans out. So here we go. We might be able to save the uh, the troll. We do. That's insane. So the troll does actually live another day because we never needed to actually have the additional fight. Um, so I am going back in time and doing that, but I definitely wanted to use this card because it is a powerful one. So this card is now discarded. Let's go ahead and flip it over. We'll put it at the very bottom of the deck. Very powerful card. And that's awesome. So this individual is out of here. Actually use. Go ahead and take it out. We'll take a look at the bottom of the card as well, because we gained some uh, VP. It says if destroyed, place two skeletons here. So that's actually a plus for us too, because that's more potential VP with the troll being here. Uh, we want to gain two VP. We don't want to forget that. So Cal will jump up to seven. And this card can now go away as well. And we'll shuffle this one just a little bit closer so you guys can see it. So we've cleared that out nicely. We finished uh, Call's command action, resolved the battle, and technically the skeletons are here. So we have to immediately fight again. Uh, now these individuals are in here. So we're going to have two, uh, we're going to have an archery round, which uh, in this case is nothing. Um, and then we're going to move into a clash now because there was no archers involved with this. So we're going to be going with one black die against two reds. It'd be an interesting fight. Come on, troll. Let's see if you can crush them. There we go. There's a bunch of damage. That was a perfect roll. So these skeletons are out of here, and that's two more VP for all. So that worked out nicely. Quite happy with that. All right. And that's it. I'd love to place a haven down, but we got to wait and go back over to uh, Fenyr here. So Fenyr has the haven down currently um and the next thing i want to do is try to get rid of some curses so that we actually have the ability to get in these spaces and place more haven if we can so if you notice over here quest wise we have uh this one here that if we can pull it off and get three bolts which is slightly tough but fenrir's got a lot of dice uh we are able to remove a curse so that is and we also have the ability if we uh resolve this successfully by just getting one of these three uh you know uh, win conditions on the quest uh, whether it's the skulls, the shields, or the bolts, we can remove all the activation tokens from one horde. You can see here, removing them from the blood worm or somebody else could be 
pretty useful for us. So let's do this. Let's do some questing and see if we can clear something out. So now we got lots of dice with Venier, and this is what's nice. So let's roll his dice off. We've got uh, two red. Uh, I'll just move this so I can actually get the dice a little easier. We've got two red. Uh, we have a purple. We have a, we'll go two orange and a blue. Now let's go. All right, so we ended up getting one, one, and then three for the skulls. I think that's going to satisfy... Oh, yikes, we just, just barely got that with the shield. Because we didn't get the bolts we needed, and we also didn't get the skulls we needed. Let me just check to make sure I have nothing else I can use that can help me. I do have the Salt Sisters things, and I'm definitely going to activate that at some point with all that uh, feat card. So we have a success, but the success is on the only column that doesn't have a reward underneath, which is unfortunate, but um, success still means we can remove activation tokens uh, from one horde. So let's go ahead and remove the ones from Bloodworm. Okay, and that's going to be it uh, for Fenrir. I will resolve the Sword Sisters one maybe in the next turn. We're back to Call here. So Call is quite happy to place a haven. This is a pretty quick decision. Uh, so we're going to drop this by three and another haven coming out for him. We'll just move the troll off the side a little bit. Done deal. Back over to Fenyr. Fenyr's going to flip this over to gain a one salt for every sword sister. Three. There's three with him currently on the board. So that's pretty easy. And then we are going to, well, I guess here's the fun part. We didn't actually discard. Let me see here. Do we discard this? Yeah, we do. So this, this quest is going to go away after we, uh, we solved it. Um, so we can say goodbye to that quest. Do we have anything else in here we could use that could help us? Let's see. So you may discard any items from the market. You may draw a new quest if we get those successfully. Uh, you may discard one revealed druid instead of this quest. Choose a hex with a curse. Remove that curse. Oh, yeah. Your druid sacrifice could work. It could do that. It's as if your hero's on a hex with a curse plus one. I am not, but I could make my... I could move my units there. Let's do that. Let's get into the same space. So let's do a command. I guess we also have to bring... Do I want to bring my Beastmaster with me or not? There's not much fighting happening over here, so I'm actually going to save myself a command point by not bringing my Beastmaster in. I thought I might do that, but I'm going to leave it there. And we're just going to move with this unit so I can save that action for something else later. So let's just do a command. Pay a food. We're going to bring Fenrir along with everybody else into this space here. And now we're going to get the advantage of having the extra die quest later. So that was the far right action done. Back over here to Call. Call is going to, well, we probably want to... Oh, let me think about this. We're only down to a single unit. Now we could go after that garrison, although the garrison could do us in just on the range attack alone, which is a little scary. I don't have wargs to make use of that anymore. Um, and after combat, actually, I forgot about this. If you have plus one units to here, you gain two resources. So I should have gained two resources after that battle. So I'm going to go ahead and give myself two, which is nice because this is actually going to allow me to buy a haven if I can pull this off, but I don't know if we can, but hey, let's give it a shot. Um, let's have Paul actually head into this location here. And that is going to be his move action. And then he's going to go ahead and he's going to explore this. Now, hopefully this actually works out in favor. We'll see. All right, so we found the Imperial Slave Mines. So remove any skeletons here, place two garrisons here. So that's going to make this way tougher. So that probably isn't going to be an option anymore. Um, but I mean, we could try it just for fun. Likely it's not going to pan out well. Uh, roll your hero dice and gain plunder per skull. So let's see what we got here. We're rolling for three red, a purple, a blue, and that's about it. Let's see how many skulls we get for this. Come on, give me lots of resources. One, two, three. Okay, and we're, it's all plunder. So one, two, three six all right and every other player gains one as well so that's not bad a one for Fenrir. okay so we've got a we've got that done we moved in we explored that is the end of Call's turn coming back over here to Fenrir. 
what do we want to do? I really want to get rid of that curse. We're going to quest. So we're going to go after this druid sacrifice one. So we get an extra orange die for this, which is handy. So let's do this. Um, we're going to go with three orange dice in the end for this one. So it will be a two red, a purple, a blue, and three orange dice. With that many dice, we should be, we should do all right, I hope. Wow, okay. Let me just make sure that that other red was supposed to be, yeah, it was. Wow, that's a lot of results. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wow. Okay, on the skulls, uh, the only thing is we needed to pass two, right? It has a two plus, so you have to get two. Uh, we definitely nailed the skulls, and I'm pretty sure we saw a bolt in there. Yeah, we got two bolts. So we definitely passed two of them. Uh, so that means, oh, we missed the shield. That's too bad. Shield would have given us a victory point. Uh, better luck next time. But it says you may discard one revealed druid card instead of this quest. That's actually pretty good because I could I can make use of this. And you'll see the solving of uh, this one is choose a hex with a curse and remove that curse, then discard this quest. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to discard this uh, curse over here. So I'll just simply go ahead and flip it over so we can't make use of it. I want to keep this Mountain Heart one for now because it's just super powerful. Um, and that'll allow me to keep this Druid Sacrifice here. Now I can choose a Hex with a Curse and remove it. We obviously want to remove the one that's sitting in the same space as us so we can actually build a Haven, stuff like that later on. And I get the ability to do this again if we head over to the Unexplored Sea Tower. Um, so this could be quite useful. All right, so that is uh, it. Now, technically, that was a quest action. So this is the second time we've done a quest with Fenrir. And that will end Fenrir's turn. Uh, next up, we've got Kal here, and he's got some issues. So as easy as this seemed originally, has got much tougher. All right, so what I'm deciding to do with Call this time is not go after the skeleton that looks like easy pickings over here. I was tempted, uh, but I think I'm going to go for a bigger gamble. This is quite a big gamble, but the cool thing is the terrain for this location is called the Highlands, uh, where this garrison is. And you can see here, it only gets one die when it rolls for range. Even though the garrison is three levels high, which normally would give it three white dice, it only gets a single die. So it's a white die in the archery. Now, if I get a blank result on this, the troll will live and can fight on and then hopefully during the clash with a black die and the troll i can pull something off here we'll have to see it's pretty risky but it should be fun so first off we have to actually get the unit in there so let's command him in this could either go really well or go really poorly um we're rolling one white die and we are praying to see uh, a blank result that's what we want to see for this archery round coming against us ah not this <laughs> not this time so the, the troll got slaughtered by the garrisons. So that didn't pan out well, uh, but it was worth a shot because, you know, it could have actually worked out. I think if we'd have gotten into a clash, uh, you know, there's potentially could have toppled a couple levels there, but uh, that's the risk. Um, so that's going to do it for Call's turn. We're going to come back over here to uh, Fenrir and Fenrir is quite happy to drop a Haven. So Fenrir is going to go ahead and spend two, as you can see right here, dropping a Haven in this location. So that's great. And that is going to do it for his turn. So we'll place this like so. Come back over to call now. We've got, uh, now this is where uh, things get interesting because units wise, I've uh, depleted my units by uh, trying to attack everything under the sun. Um, so at this point, the only things that I could potentially do is to bank. I could bank on some quests uh, at this point because call does have some decent dice. He's got three red, a purple, and a blue. The question is, do I want to use uh, maybe this one over here to bolster my resources potentially? Uh, this one allows me actually, if I'm successful, to draw a new quest. So that could actually work out in my favor too. Um, I need to be on a C tower to take advantage of the plus one purple. I'm not on the C tower right now. This other one, the uh, Druid Sacrifice, you have to be on a place with a curse to get that advantage. And I think I'm going to leave that, like I said, for Fenrir to do uh, one more time. So let's actually quest. Let's do the uh, navigator's quest and see how it pans out. So we've got uh, three red and a purple and a blue. So I'll go ahead and spend the action point as well down on the quest. What do we got here? So th four skulls and a bolt. I think that's going to do it because it only need one, right? Yes, we got two. And it does say you may discard any items from the market. Okay, so I could actually ditch a bunch of items if there is something in here I don't 
wants. But I'm going to actually discard all these. Let's take a look at a whole new set of cards. Discard this to gain one red. Uh, discard this to move one Hoarder Legion to an adjacent hex without activating and healing potion. Place one of your units destroyed here on any of your havens. <laughs> look at that. That's interesting. So I yeah, could be something to buy in the future. Okay. Um, and then the solving of this thing, uh, we get uh, if every player is going to gain a resource for each shield and bolt. Unfortunately, that's not very many. Uh, so it's just going to be the uh, going to be one. Uh, but it can be any resource I want it to be. So that's a plus. Um, haven wise for call, he's not looking to build too many more havens. He's got enough plunder, I think. Food wise, he's a okay because he has enough command and move around. So I'll just give him a salt. I don't think we'll be happy with that. On Fenrir's side of things, let's go ahead and give a food just because he's actually got an army. All right, and then uh, this quest is discarded. So this thing is going to go away. All right, so the only one we have left is Druid Sacrifice, which is okay because that's what I plan to do with uh, Fenrir right now. But just not at this moment, actually. I want to get in this space. So I'm going to go ahead and move my hero into this location. Uh, it is cursed, though. It's unfortunate. So I got to deal with that. Let's go move. And you're going to come in here. All right. So for the next action I'm going to do, because the move was on the left hand side, I'm going to do an action for commanding. We're going to go ahead and place and spend a food. And we're going to send the units in here. Now I can move my units into this space. Normally, when you've seen me doing this, when I do a command action, usually the, the tiles uh, flip face up. When a curse is on it like this, it's considered to be explored. So these units are allowed to move in with a command action like this. Um, later on, my plan is to actually go in here and, uh, you know, my plan is to actually go in here and explore it. Uh, but it looks like I might run out of action points to actually place a haven, which was my original plan. Uh, but we'll we'll go with what I've got there because I don't think there was anything else I could do. Uh, so for call here, we're going to go ahead and move. Now, we're not moving into chapter three or four during this playthrough, but if we were playing all the way through to the end uh, in a full size game, then you'd want to put him in an advantageous position for the next chapter at this point, being that his army has been depleted and things like that. So what I would do is probably move him over to this side of the board where there's areas to explore and garrisons to take down. So I'm going to basically go like this and move him over to here for one action. And then I'm going to use my final action for him to move him to a spot where he can start to explore. Not only is he adjacent to his havens where he can command units into it in the future, he's also closer to one of the enemies he would want to take down the Legion uh, unit in the future as well. So this is a good spot for him. And then we come back over to Fenrir and Fenrir is here. We are, like I said before, we're just a little bit short on being able to get the last haven down, but we can attempt right now to at least quest. Um, the good thing is the quest could actually give us some uh, VP. And, and we didn't nail it the first time, but we'll we'll get it this time, I hope. Uh, so we got the uh, orange die coming in because this area is cursed on top of everything else that Fenrir has here. So let's use this last action to quest. So it's going to be two red, uh, a blue, and three orange, and a purple. Lots of dice. So here we go. And did we get it? We got a lot of skulls. That's crazy. I it's actually insane. That's a really, really high roll for the skull. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, oh, and that's the worst too, because we needed to actually get two of these to be successful. So technically, this actually triggers chaos to gain two points, unfortunately. Uh, and then of course this is discarded now. So we've actually burnt all of the quests. Uh chaos is gonna jump up on top of the empire there. And that is going to do it in terms of the actions. We are now completely depleted uh, so we can move on to the next phase. So now we're going into the nemesis phase. First off, we have a warlock over here. So the warlock is sitting in this location right here. Uh, and being that it's in a space with a garrison, the first thing it's going to try to do is to uh, to build a garrison, uh, but it can't. So it basically just bumps itself up on the track here. So go up one space like that. Um, the next, and I'll take this activation token off as well and place it over here. Uh, the next thing it's going to do is it's going to focus on its target and move towards it. So it's going to head in this direction like that. 
One thing that's worth noting with the Warlock is he doesn't just move one space. He's always trying to get to his target. And you'll notice on his card in the special rules there, it says the Warlock is always adjacent to any hex, which means he literally can, from the space he was in, go right to the capital, right to his target. So he'll move there. And the Bloodworm has no activation tokens whatsoever. Skip past that. The Banish is down here in the bottom right. So we'll use this activation token to go once. Tries to place a curse, but can't, so gains a point. And we'll go ahead and move it to the empty hex right here. That's it for the banished. Next up, the executioner. What does it have in terms of its abilities here? Nothing pertaining to its movement, but it's going towards its target. Uh, the executioner is currently at the capital, so it's going to be heading towards its target. So it's going to move one space into here. It also will build a garrison first in this location before it moves. So we'll go ahead and just put a level one garrison in here like so. And that is going to do it for the activations of each of those units. And just like that, we're moving into the next phase, production. So we're gaining resources based on our total haven. So Paul here has two salt coming in, one plunder, and five for food. And then over here, we have five salt. That's a lot of salt total for Fenrir. He's got tons. Uh, two plunder and a food. And then we're going to gain resources shown on every hex with one of your havens. So we'll start with call here. He's got uh, two salt, two salt. So he's got four. So five, one, and one. Now it's going to break down for him. One, three, four, five, one, one. And then we'll come over to Fenyr, who's going to have quite a bit as well. So what do we get? Plunder and food. So it'll be one, three, three will be the breakdown for him. Two, three, and one, two, three. And uh, that's going to be it for the production phase. Moving along to the scoring phase. All right, here's where we find out how this game actually ends. Fenrir is way behind in the scoring right now, but we'll see if we can get that uh, fixed and hopefully catch these guys. So starting with the Empire, uh, we've got for every hex with a garrison. So one, two, three, four, let me count again. So three, four, five, six total. So let's go ahead and bring this up to 19. And then for every Legion in play, we've got two. So that's going to jump to 21. And then uh, two for every faction in the Imperial Graveyard, just one in there. So just a jump of two points. Uh, Chaos is next. So for every curse, there's actually quite a few curses on this board. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's a lot of curses. Uh, so eight's going to jump. Wow. Okay. So we're going to go to 21. And then for every horde in play, we have two. So they're actually on top of each other right now. And then anything in the Chaos Graveyard, yes, there's just one faction worth, so a jump of two. So Chaos actually jumps out ahead just a little bit. Okay, so now we're coming over to us. How well did we do, and can we catch up to these guys? So two for each of the Havens in play. So that's going to bump uh, Fenrir from four up to ten. Uh, we'll do Fenrir all the way through. Uh, for special hexes, do we happen to get any extra points? only one so i'm looking at the gem basically uh, that's on each of these to trigger and there's only one and then now we can pay five resources per hero so let's do that for fenya right now so this is going to be quite a bit so in total we have uh let's see 18 so 28 uh 28 34 so oh just shy so that's going to be six points if i'm doing that correctly in my head so it's going to jump him to 17, and that is going to be just shy. He'll only have one resource after that left. Uh, so he's up there. And then Call. It doesn't look like Fenrir is going to make it. Uh, Call, on the other hand, has two havens, or sorry, three havens for two points each. So jumping to 15. And then Special Hex Wise has one point of VP. And then in terms of resources, has, let's see, this is 28. So that's going to be a total of five. Just shy of another one. So one, two, three, four, five. No. <laughs> so we were we were right there, uh, but just not enough uh, to be able to actually uh, get out in front of them this time around. So here is the page that specifically talks about winning the game. It says at the end of the last chapter, the game is over. And of course, we're only playing two chapters. So we stop here, normally go all the way to four. If all the players uh, each individually have more VP than the Empire and the Chaos at the end of the last chapter, congratulations, you win. You've collectively built the strongest possible bulwark against the encroaching Chaos and defeated the Relic of the Empire. Your allied people will be able to forge new nations in the ruins. Now, 
for our situation, it says at the end of the last chapter, if the empire has equal or more points than a player, your people face enslavement again as they are outflanked and ground down by their military machine. So that definitely occurred. And then on top of it, at the end of the last chapter, if chaos has equal or more, you have suffered a fate worse than death. Either way, there is little hope left for life. Uh, the free factions have faltered before the tide. So that is going to do it. That is a full run through of the very first game that you go through. So even when you play the game for the very first time, it's recommended you play through the first two chapters to get a feel for the game. And then you can go the extra mile. There is tons of opportunity here for me to jump out ahead of these guys if we actually play through the full four chapters. And your strategy is going to involve every single time you play the game because you're going to make different choices, uh, different resolving of the dice. Uh, it obviously has impacts on the combat, the questing and things of that nature. So there's a lot here to dig into strategy wise, but I really hope this gives you a really great overview as to how to play Uprising. Thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, keep on rolling solo.